Is there an argument that conservative values can work? Anyone that does not align with its agenda is peripheralized, invisibilized, yeah. marginalized. So it's like Biden getting pumped up with vitamins and Adderall and caffeine. What's going on? Some people would say that's naive. What I think is naive is assuming we're going to survive on this planet for another hundred years. It does America need to have some more Asian values? So well, America needs to be more Buddhist. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, but What's going on, everybody? What you're about to watch is an unedited interview with Marianne Williamson. This interview happened the day after Joe Biden clinched the nomination, meaning that Marianne cannot win, but she continues her journey. So she has a really cool perspective. I recommend you guys watch the whole thing through. There's some jokes, but also a lot of serious talk. And to answer the question, how come I haven't spoken to any Republican candidates on video? Well, the truth is the Republicans aren't hitting me back. The Dems are down to chat, and it's as simple as that. So anyways, guys, hope you enjoy this. Please hit that like button, and let's go. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, giving me, uh, I know you're a very busy person, and I know that even yesterday, there's a lot of news that we got to talk about and go through, um, but it's an honor to sit down with you because I, I always like sitting down with anybody who's very smart, intelligent, and brave, and who runs for president, wants to make an impact and uh, at the very least get their message out. So I, th I think that's why I'm, I'm very glad to sit down with you. Thank you. Thank glad you. To uh, be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. Uh, I appreciate your time. Um, I guess. Uh, I guess. In, immediately. Um, I got a notification last night, 15 hours ago, saying that Biden has clinched the primary. I guess, where does that leave you? Is that true? And what does that mean for you? The president has clinched the nomination. Um, this was not a primary. The DNC said there would be no primary, that they had already decided it would be the president. Mm. So I have lived inside the belly of that beast of the way politics operates for the last year. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I see how the system makes sure that anyone that does not align with its agenda is peripheralized, invisibilized, yeah. marginalized, erased, yeah. in my case. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think that a primary and a political campaign in general, particularly a presidential campaign, is the most important platform uh, for a conversation for the American people to have among ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this conversation of serious authentic analysis of what is wrong in this country and what we might do to make it right was suppressed. Mm. As long yeah. as I'm on these ballots, I can still use this as an opportunity to talk about these things. Right. In addition to that, in addition to that, I think that anything less than the conversation I'm having and the Democrats will not win in 2024. Wow. Um, I think that this campaign is much more like 2016 than around 2020 than it is like 2020. I feel that similarly to 2016, the Democratic establishment elite um, has no clue what's going on in this country. <clears throat> when you have 39% of Americans who are reporting that they're regularly skipping meals in order to pay their rent, yeah, when half the people who are renting can't afford that rent, when people are living paycheck to paycheck, unable to absorb a thousand dollars unexpected expenditure 70 percent that's a majority and then 70 percent say that they're living with chronic economic uh anxiety this is a country that's mm -hmm. about to blow this yeah. is this is not sustainable this is going to fall in one direction or the other it's mm -hmm. either going to fall in the direction of greater economic hope and opportunity justice and economic good and inspiration and motivation for real fundamental change in this country, or it's going to fall in the direction of chaos and authoritarianism. And so, uh, if nothing else- I, Sorry, I just want to, I think everything you said is true. I've I've been hearing that, that even the Democrats, which democracy is in the name, is even in the <clears> way, <throat> in a way, getting in the way of democracy. I mean, a lot of people blame the Republicans for getting in the way of democracy, but it seems like the Democratic Party, maybe not Democrats, but the Democratic Party kind of got in their own way. I guess so. I want to be clear. People can still vote for you on the ballot. You are not stepping out of the race. You have not suspended, even though you came back, you're you're on the ballot. 
Yes, and Marian, uh, people can go to marianne2024.com. Please support, please donate so that I can continue to travel. I will be in Chicago um, this week, Arizona, then Louisiana, and uh, New York, and Missouri. Yeah, I mean, this we. It, it, what the DNC decided this year was that the threat to democracy on the part of Donald Trump is so great. And I don't disagree with them on that, but they feel that they're the geniuses who know how to deal with this. And they mm. have decided in their infinite sense of entitlement that Joe Biden is the best person to beat Trump. And so they basically suppress democracy yeah. in order to, in their mind, save democracy. This is not the traditional role of the uh, political party. It's the, it's the very thing that George Washington and John Adams warned us about. It should be the people deciding uh, how to take on Donald Trump. And I, I agree. I guess uh, real quick about Biden, and we're going to get into some questions about spirituality. I know that you're a very spiritual person. Uh, you wrote a lot of books on that. I want to get into the questions about conspiracy theories, just your opinion on it. But Biden, uh, he gave a, everybody agrees that he gave a good state of the union, but like there's also these conspiracies like, oh, he's on Adderall. So it's like Biden getting pumped up with vitamins and Adderall and caffeine. What's going on? Well, I don't have any inside knowledge, but I have eyes with which to see. I have ears right. with which to hear. Enough said. All right. Well, we're moving on. Um, first of all, I, I think that the fact that you're still pushing, uh, even though Biden has clinched and you're still out there on the road and you're still going to hit up cities and you're still going to spread your message and make uh, a point and, and get votes, you're still going to get votes. I think that that is, um, yeah, that's very noble of you. And, and I think that goes to show you your heart for the issues and, and your message. Um, I guess, uh, uh, quick, do you, have you heard of the, I'm sure you're familiar with this term, the fourth turning. Yes. yes. Do you believe America in this Western society that we're in and it more applies to, I believe Anglo societies or Western societies. Do you think we're in the fourth turning and, and it's generally like, that's your feeling? Yes. And that's why I think that this is such an important moment to grab the wheel of history. So the political, uh, I call it a political media uh, industrial complex, because the media is very much a part of it. They like work in partnership. It's very stuck in a 20th century transactional model of politics, which sees that if we allow the real regeneration of human civilization at this time, if we allow for the real regeneration of American politics at this time, their reign is over. Mm. All right. I, I and I, I you you mentioned industrial complex that phrase. I've heard of the mi military industrial complex, the food industrial complex. You just mentioned the political industrial complex. These are things that now common regular folks like that are not political at all. They didn't take poli sci. They're not even into politics. They're not in these secret rooms or anything. People are throwing out these terms. It's kind of like when everybody started trading stocks three years ago and everybody's talking about all these stocks and they don't know what they're talking about, but like these industrial complex phrases, how is it true? Like, are these real things and how as regular Americans are you supposed to have any hope when these industrial complexes exist and there's feels like there's nothing you can do? Well, you've got to stop farming out your own best critical thinking. You know, when it comes to our personal lives, Americans tend to get very deep and authentic and psychologically perspicacious, and we think things through. We don't stand for toxic relationships or abusive relationships, and we set boundaries, and we're all into and psychology, all of that. But when it comes to politics, we've been trained to think and act like sixth graders. We've like farmed out our best thinking, and so it makes us very easy to play. So we have surrendered, we have acquiesced to this political, like there's some set of geniuses over there, this political class, the ones who are experienced, the ones who are qualified. Look what they've brought us. They brought us six inches from the cliff in terms of the state of the environment, in terms of the state of our economy, in terms of the state of our democracy, in terms of the state of our bodies, in terms of the state of the world. And these forces, just listen, whether you're talking about slavery, you're talking about institutional suppression of women, talking about the Gilded Age, talking about segregation, those, those forces of injustice were repudiated by generations which rose up 
and said, no, 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 that's undemocratic and that's not what we're doing here. Today, the problem is not one particular institutional reality so much as it's an economic paradigm. Mm. The idea that short-term profits for huge corporate forces should be our bottom line are rather than the safety, health, and the well-being of the American people. It has become our governing principle. And that's your governing principle. Democracy is not. You mm. can't have a thriving democracy when you don't have a thriving middle class. And this system has made the middle class in America collapse. You have a tiny portion of Americans who own three, some half right. of all the wealth in this country. Right. So, that's not a democracy. That's not a right. democracy. No, we're an oligarchy. We are ruled and we are governed. So so this political system, it, it's pretending you have this great democracy here, but they're telling you who your candidates can be. And I think your candidates, candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. And so that's- America's only been around for a few hundred years. Really, it's a really young country in the scheme of things and really a young country considering how powerful it has been. Right. How do we even know democracy actually works? Like, is is America just one big science experiment? And like, we're kind of coming to the end of the experiment. Like, no, I don't that's how it feels. No, 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 no. I don't see the story that way at all. Let's go back to the beginning. OK, let's go back to 1776. <clears throat> in 1776, some very brave men. 56 of them, as a matter of fact, signed the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is our mission statement. It's our North Star. And it includes the principles on which we purport to stand. They were radical in 1776, and they're radical today. Mm. And every generation, in the Jewish religion, it says every generation must rediscover God for itself. Every generation of Americans need to rediscover the real meaning of the Declaration of Independence for us. And if we don't, then those principles lose their moral and emotional force. Mm. And we become easy to play. And we've been played. That's exactly what's happened. Mm. So when we revisit them, we see their radicalism, that all men are created equal, that everyone is created with the inalienable rights, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which means self-actualization in today's terms. You can do whatever you want to do, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. That government's role, government is instituted, it says, to secure those rights, not thwart those rights or undercut those rights or diminish those rights, but to secure those rights. And it gets even more radical, where it says that if the government's not doing that job, it is the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. Now, that's where it started with these ideas that literally changed the world. But that moment of beginning is also where you see how gnarly it gets as well. Because Mm. out of the 56 signers, 41 of them were slave owners. Now, that's the American story. That is the story, the struggle and the dichotomy, which is iterated in every generation, even ours. Mm -hmm. between forces of unbelievable political, social, and even economic enlightenment versus forces who, for their own ideological and or financial purposes, have no intention whatsoever of seeing those principles made manifest. And every generation reiterates it, some more dramatically than others. Now, in terms of the question you ask, if you look at the arc of American history, there's a lot to be impressed by. The abolitionist movement responded to abolition. The women's suffragist movement responded to institutionalized suppression. Um, the early labor organizing responded to the Gilded Age and the civil rights movement responded to segregation. It's simply our turn. Mm. So we need to see that we're, what we're going through is no different than what other generations have gone through. Let's just not be the first one to wimp out on doing what it takes. Too. Don't wimp out. I like that. I like the message. Um, That's what we're doing right now. If you give all your power to a political elite, you are completely uh, surrendering your democracy. All right. No, I, I, I'm i with you. Um, I mean, it seems like that uh, in this Democrat-Republican battle, I mean, uh, it, see, it feels so much like, yeah, and I, and I get what you're saying because it just feels like a lot of the people are, I guess I would use the word moderate. I identify kind of as a moderate, like I almost, I could have gone either way if there was a Republican <clears throat> candidate that I thought was legitimate. I, I wouldn't have been 
afraid to vote for that just because that's kind of like where I'm at. And I guess this is a kind of a question about, I guess, Democrats, because it seems like I'm, I'm Asian and a lot of Asian Americans are actually leaving the Democratic Party. Not that it's it's not yet 50 50 between the Asian American voters, but there's uh, quite a few that have moved over to the Republican side, actually, statistically in the past uh, uh, eight years. So I guess like uh, what like. What is wrong with the Democrats in the past eight, 10 years that have made people leave? Like, let's be honest. Like, is it the crime? Is it they they are have a reputation like they don't care about crime? They have the reputation that they're focusing on the wrong issues. Like, is there any truth to that? The problem with the Democratic Party is that they have dropped their Rooseveltian unequivocal advocacy for the working uh, people of the United States. If they were continuing to hold to unequivocal advocacy for the working people of the United States, we would have Medicare for all, which they have mm. in every other advanced democracy. We would have tuition-free college and tech school, a system which we had in place until the 1970s. We would have a guaranteed living wage we would have the things that actually help people economically thrive who are actually part of the majority of Americans. But let's, once again, let's look at the larger context. When I was growing up, more than not, not completely, but more than not, the Republican Party was dominated by the high-minded conservative principles, and the Democratic Party was dominated by the high-minded liberal principles. And that's why, why Eisenhower could say the American mind at its best is both liberal and conservative. At this point, the Republican Party has become completely dominated by this corporatist element to the point where you are talking about a neo-fascist perspective because it's such a that's such a deep marriage of, of corporate power and governmental power, which by the way is personified by Donald Trump. The Democratic Party is trying to have it both ways. And this has been true ever since the Democratic Leadership Council, where they want to help people, but they and this is this is exactly what uh, President Biden is as the corporatist Democrat most in, empowered. They do want to help people, but they won't go any further once they get to the point where to go further would undercut the bottom line of their corporate donors. So what you have is the Democratic Party split into two parts between the establishment corporatists and the progressives. But what mm. is disappointing to me in this campaign is to see how the, even the progressives fall totally in line with the DNC when it comes to something like a presidential election. So there's something that happens to people once they get in there. They're very good um, on Twitter still, though. They'll, they'll totally show up as major progressives on Twitter. Uh, on your website, um, I was reading because crime is a big concern for a lot of people, not just Asians, but particularly Asians. A statistic just came out in New York City that 78 percent of Asians surveyed uh, were fearing for some part of their safety was a huge concern for them, was the number one concern in the city. Um, it says regarding crime, education and culture are the strongest preventative medicines Uh what is the culture that you're referring to? I guess, is it the media culture, the gun culture? Is it the video games? Is it the, uh, the music? Is it the movies? What, um, I guess I'm just curious because that's, culture is a very big word. Uh, it can mean a lot of things. We have a multidimensional breakdown here. We have an all systems breakdown and it's going to need an all systems response. You could look at something like guns, for instance. The conversation used to be, is it the guns or is it the culture? Clearly, any sophisticated look at that today, it's both. Obviously, it's the fact that we have such lax gun safety laws, by the way, contrary to, to the de express will of the majority of Republicans as well as Democrats, including gun owners. But it's also the glorification of violence. It's all of the above. When you look at how many billions of dollars are made on violent video games, millions of billions of dollars made on products that are sold to children uh, that are violent, billions of dollars of uh, dollars that are made on violent movies and gratuitous violence. I'm not talking about violence used for genuinely artistic purposes, like someone like a Martin Scorsese. I'm talking about cheap, gratuitous stuff, including a lot of violence against women, by the way. Mm. That is nothing other than getting more clicks and making more sales. And of course, it's poisoning the air. Um, we're not going to be an, uh, we're not going to be able to deal with the violence in our society until we also <clears throat> make a commitment among ourselves to being a nonviolent society. We're living How do we do that? 
though. Like that is, I feel like violence is built into the American uh, ethos. It's almost like we're a rebel. It's, and this is my opinion. It feels like a rebel country. Go get it at any cost. Defend yourself. Someone steps on your yard, punch them or shoot them. Like, you know what I mean? It wasn't always this bad at all. There were even some ethical rules in the wild, wild west. Even in the wild, wild west, when they came into a town, they had to surrender their guns while they were there. This is mm. this is what's happening now. There is a complete ethical breakdown. This is what unfettered soulless capitalism has done to us. It's just get what you want at all costs. Look at Twitter. Twitter's a violent, violent place. <laughs> the way people lie. The, you know, lying about someone is violence. You know, we all need to read a little Buddhism here about, you know, violence of speech, you know, right speech, right. So thought. America That's needs to be more Buddhist. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, you know, Buddhism, I believe in the universal spiritual principles and all the uh, uh, great religions and spiritual teachings of the world. Yes, we have to be more humble. We have to be more merciful. We have to be more loving. What are you doing so casually? insulting people, lying about people, smearing people, all those things are violence. So it has to start in our own hearts, seeking mm. to be more harmless people. All so, of us have to make ethical decisions all the time in our careers. Um, it it doesn't feel like that. I'm sorry to interrupt. I hope. Uh, do it, Does America need to have some more Asian values? <laughs> like, and I, and I know Asian values, that's a big term, but like, it's well, kind of you know, Judaism and Christianity it. came up with, you know, love one another and walk humbly with thy God, act mercy and do, you know, right, justice. Right. Okay. Justice so, we, so all the great religious traditions uh, extend into the world uh, I, the highest, the highest principles that, of truth. That, that's a that's a good point. And and I was just obviously it'd be funny if you said be more Asian, but I know that's not that's not actually the accurate well, answer. And, you know, Jubus, they said when I was younger, I remember having a. Uh, conversation we called them when I was growing up we call uh, uh, my generation of like college uh, time there were often people called Jew booze uh, all these Jews who were at Buddhist monasteries oh that's hilarious <laughs> um so I yeah I guess man um the values in America need to change now what now that statement the values of America needs to change now I'm just saying in that statement that we both agree but there's even different perspectives on that, right? Because a lot of the conservatives or the traditional conservatives or the people who are considered conservative nowadays are going to say, the values of America need to change. We need to change back. I'm sorry, that's not how all conservatives talk, but, you know, I'm in a comical way. So I guess the point is what I'm saying is that, is there an argument that conservative values can work or can work for certain people or like, we can all exist together. Why is there an argument whether your family is being conservative and having traditional traditional values and that's and that's outdated or, oh, that these progressive ideas are not going to work and they're happy go lucky and no one's going to. It's, it's too complex. Like, you know what? Do you get my question? I, think yeah. I understand what you're saying, but I think we all need to come out of our silos right now. And some of these labels actually limit rather than expand the conversation. Uh, there are values of righteousness, which is just the things that you and I were talking about before, that we love one another. Now, where progressivism comes in is that we would argue that those principles of righteousness should guide our public policy as well. But when it comes to personal behavior, I see as much smug, arrogant self-righteousness on the left as I see on the right. And this projection onto other people that because of a political position they take, that they have no values, that they don't care. So I think that a lot of the, we, we need to go back to neutral here. Just each and every one of us trying to be a better person, caring less, God, you know, we were not sent to this earth to monitor other people. We were sent to this earth to try to be better ourselves. Martin Luther King said, you have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. So when we go into any situation, people can subconsciously feel it when we're looking down on them. So whether we're on the left or the, on the right, we all have to remember, no one has a monopoly on truth. No one has a monopoly on this country. We all get to own it, guys. And number three, nobody owes it to you to agree with you. Mm.
The issue is not trying to get other people to agree with you, but you're finding that sweet spot, that sort of namaste consciousness before you even open your mouth and with which you listen to people. And then there's a yin and a yang. Like I said, you know, nobody has a monopoly on truth here. And when we stop learning from one another, and then you talk about the meanness of this time, we're living at a time now where it's not only that you disagree with me, but because you dis disagree with me, you are wrong. It is, uh, you are wrong and you should shut up. Now, I, all of us, that's violence and we all have to take responsibility for the part in ourselves that would go there. And I, I agree that we're kind of in violent times and there's a lot of aggression right now. I guess one criticism to that or to back that up is that a lot of people are going to say, well, America needs to be a strong country. America has to be strong and you can't be strong without being aggressive and muscular and buff and have a bunch of guns and weapons ready. Is that true? Because we still live in a time when there's still enemies and rivals in this world, countries that are don't care about America or care less about America, that America needs to stand strong in an aggressive manner. How can America be strong if America takes a more, I guess, like empathetic, like kind of like uh, internal, you know, whatever we're talking about? Well, you know, there's the yin and the yang, the masculine and the feminine. So you just presented a view of really not even not even masculine, but this kind of toxic masculine that's just about aggression. Uh, that's that's there's nothing high minded about that description of things. Love is the greatest strength. If you really want to exercise strength, take better care of your children, mm. take better care, create more economic opportunities, create, you know, I want a department of peace and within, because we need to have an army of peace builders as much as we have an, have an army of, of um, military personnel. And there are four factors within peace building, mm. which statistically indicate that if uh, these things are present, you'll have a higher incident of peace and a lower incidence of, 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 of violence, economic, greater economic opportunities for women, greater educational opportunities for children, a reduction of violence against women, and an amelioration of unnecessary human despair. Those things are strength. Mm. If you do not exercise that more yin strength, feminine strength, mm. right? And that's not just man, woman, it's masculine, feminine aspects of character. Then mm. you will need all that aggression. Then you will think you need all that brute force in the form of prisons and bombs. It's not working. It's not sustainable. Mm. Never ending conflict. And at this point, it's a threat to, to the species and to the earth itself. I that's a great answer. I want to talk about real, I don't know if we can talk about this real quick, but I guess the migrant and the border issue is a really, uh, that and I would say Israel, Palestine are like divide, those are like deciding issues in this, or at least they were before we just got the two old guys back. So I guess like, wh what is, what's your, uh, I guess, opinion on what's going on in Gaza right now? And then also I want to talk about the border real quick and then two a few other things and then that's it well what's going on in gaza right now is unconscionable and the united states should not be supporting it and we have to say no to bb netanyahu we need a two-state solution uh neither of those peoples is, are going anywhere uh the palestinian people are not hamas uh the israeli people are not benjamin netanyahu mm. uh, the United States should uh, display robust and equal commitment to the peace and the security and the sovereignty of both people. Uh, we need a ceasefire. We also need release of those hostages, and we need that path to a two-state solution. It's not going to be easy. People have certainly tried. Uh, Bill Clinton tried. Um, Do you think way, Biden or Trump could, could I don't know about solve the issue, but at least quell? Trump, Trump is being very shrewd right now. He's not saying a word. Very shrewd, very shrewd. He's, uh, um, yeah. I, he's, I, I, oh, oh, sorry, continue. Finish no, that, he please. Certainly did not display uh, in, in his presidency. I remember uh, Jared Kushner, who was his Middle East liaison, uh, saying that the problem with the Palestinians was nothing other than the words he used to describe it was a real estate dispute. That was the, the level of his understanding. Yeah. 
thing yeah. and of moral discernment. Um, yeah. So, you know, when 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 President Trump moved the um, uh, moved the embassy to Jerusalem, it was a stick in the eye. Uh, mm. He came up with the Arab with the Abraham Accords, but within the Abraham Accords, the rights of the Palestinians was given short shrift, which was one of, I think, the motivating factors uh, for Hamas to, you know, take advantage of this period of time, mm. along with the conversations that Israel was having with uh, Saudi Arabia. So at this point, uh, the United States, our highest ally, must be humanity itself. Mm. And we cannot afford to support any policy which transgresses our own at least the human values on which we purport to stand. That well, is true. We killed a million people in Iraq, so. Yeah, that's uh, definitely on our uh, on our history. I, uh, as, as far as, um, um, yeah, 10 minutes left, because I only have the uh, regular Zoom subscription, so I have the free one. Uh, when it comes to migrants at the border, I think, what is i think most people agree that the border needs to be secure right that's just logical from a country perspective i guess what do you do with the people now that have made it in not i'm not saying they're all bad a lot of them are working hard there's probably some bad apples uh and it's just a like the influx of people is just hard to deal with i guess what what how should people view this from from your perspective well, a lot of people might not realize that Ronald Reagan gave millions of people amnesty. So there are a lot of people who have been waiting for years and, they're, and they are forced to live in the shadows. A lot of undocumented people should not have to be undocumented. Like you said, they work hard, they raise families, they contribute to the society and they are forced to live in the shadows and there should be a system by which they can become citizens more easily. And of course, that includes the DACA kids. In terms of what's actually happening at the border, a lot of this is based on the failure of Congress over decades uh, mm. and we need the infrastructure. Remember, the Democrats and the Republicans had come up with a bill not long ago, billions of dollars that was going to be spend it, spent at the border, creating what we need, the proper infrastructure, the judges, the adjudicators, people who know how to interrogate, who are professionals, mm. to establish where there is and there is not credible fear, giving someone a valid claim of asylum creating a situation so that they are then led to integration into American society, the others led back. Wow. And it was Donald Trump who then told the Republican leaders to kill that bill, to not vote for it. Why? Because it would have worked. And he didn't want to give Biden a win during uh, an election campaign season. Now, wow. no matter what we do, however, no matter what infrastructure we create, no matter how many walls, no matter how many surveillance systems, you're going to have to address root cause, which is central to my entire campaign. Mm. The old fashioned transactional politics only talks about symptoms. We have to talk about root cause. Mm. Yeah. You know, you have, you can't just talk about October 7th. You also have to talk about the settlements, the illegality of the settlements and the, the West Bank occupation and so forth. OK, right. when it comes to the immigration from Latin America, there are two main categories that drive people to immigrate so desperately that someone would actually walk across the Darien Gap, one of the least hospitable uh, uh, pieces of land on the planet, with children no less, okay? Mm -hmm. Economic despair and uh, and fear of the violence is being perpetrated by the drug cartels. Mm -hmm. Now, in both cases, America can do something. A lot of the economic destabilization of these Latin American countries has America's fingerprints on it. If you look at American foreign policy in Latin America over the last 50 years, we should be willing to help restabilize some of these economies that clearly we help destabilize. Right. And that's, by the way, removing the sanctions from Venezuela. Hmm. On the level of the drug cartels, one of my core issues is we need to end America's war on drugs. One of the things it does is it feeds our prison industrial complex because almost half of our federal prisoners are nonviolent drug offenders. And number two, it creates the black market that gives the market to the drug cartel. So as we uh, end America's drug war and instead make it a sobriety system and treat drugs like a health issue rather than a criminal issue like they do in places like uh, Portugal, although we will not completely solve the problem with the drug cartels, we'll put a big dent mm. in
Yeah, I, I, I think um, when when people feel like it would just be safer to have a bunch more police out on the streets due to the crime or whether it's the drugs or all that stuff, I guess, how do you respond to the people who just feel safer when there's just more police force and they're coming down on drug dealers more and and because that's as a per as a regular citizen, you kind of like, I guess, like to see that because you're like, yeah, like someone's laying down the law, you know, how do you balance that? <laughs> Ask a black person if they agree with that. Uh, I'll yeah, that's that's true. I'll ask some of my friends. Um, real quick, China. Um, as a Chinese American uh, with roots in China, I think that obviously how China is viewed in the media and um, is going to affect the way a lot of Chinese people are treated. I'm always I'm already hearing about Yale grad students who can't come back to America after visiting family. Um, you hear about Chinese migrants of military age and men that are coming over the border and people are very scared of that. I guess, um, is China something to be concerned about and how do we deal with that relationship? Well, first of all, there's a big difference between the Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party. It's just like there's a big difference between the Iranian people and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's. I mean, we have to even or or Palestinians and Hamas versus Israelis and and uh, um, uh, Netanyahu. We've we've got to change our thinking here. We've got to all stand back and the set the the idea of separating ourselves into all these silos is is it's it, it, it you know people say we need more unity. But the, the separation begins in our heads. And hmm. we, doesn't, we don't just need more unity within our country. We need more unity on our planet. We are going to have to. If you take AI, if you take the environment and you take nuclear energy, we are going to have to forge a more collaborative relationship with China, with India, with Russia, with Brazil. Mm -hmm. All of the nations of the world in this century, we're going to have to move into a more collaborative relationship. Now, so when you hear about the thing the, about like the spies here and there or people that uh, I mean, and then there are some spies, right? I mean, that absolutely, as, as we have them, too. But I listen, I, I don't think any of us should be naive about the shenanigans of the of the communist uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. However, when you hear people stoking the bear. Mm. When you hear people talking in a way, and that's what happened with Ukraine. We spoke the bear. Uh, there's almost like new Cold War conversation going on. I, right. I think, you know, after what we have been through in Iraq, in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, after what's, seeing what's going on in Ukraine, seeing what's happening in Gaza, we've got to check ourselves. There are people in Washington who actually, they're kind of, Frothing at the mouth at the thought that, ooh, we might have a war with China. No, no, no. So you I think that would be a terrible idea. A, a terrible idea doesn't even begin to cover it. Doesn't even begin to cover it. We have to imagine a planet without war 100 years from now and reverse engineer from there. Uh, I have that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, that's why we need a Department of Peace. And we need to... Um, talk about far more ways that we can actually collaborate with China on the areas that we need to collaborate and have healthy yeah. competition on the areas where healthy competition is called for. Um, yeah, I, I I agree. I don't know. Maybe we need some like precognition, like technology. Maybe Apple Vision or the the AI can help predict what the how to not have wars in the future. Uh, Hold on, I'd like to speak to that because you just said something really interesting. One of the things that I talk about in talking about the Department of Peace, right now they play war games. We need to play peace games. Interesting. And we should do exactly what you just said. We need to do exactly, instead of spending all of our resources planning for the next war, figuring out the next war, we should be planning for an era in which humanity has a, more, a greater guarantee to survive. You know, some people would say that's naive. What I think is naive is assuming we're going to survive on this planet for another 100 years if we don't at least try. I like it. Uh, one minute left. What can you say to Gen Z or concerned millennials um, just about what they should be doing right now. What can we be doing? I mean, I guess voting for people like you or voting, like what can we just do as people 
that will give us some power, go. I see you doing it. Just, I think everybody, no matter what our age right now, most people, I think the majority of people recognize the depth of, of, of uh, problem and, and are feeling a yearning to step up. I just yeah. think we all, if anything, just need to look at each other and say, how can I help you step up more? Uh, I'll very, get, you know, I'll ask your friend, friend, ask your neighbor, ask a community member, how do you step up? Think, I Listen, the time's going to run out and it's probably going to click uh, out. Uh, Marianne, thank you so much for your time. Um, and, you know, thank you for being a bold person with positive ideas. And, uh, yeah, I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your leg and, and whatever you continue to do. So thank I you. thank you. Thank you Appreciate so much. It was good chatting with you. All right. You Until yeah. next time, everybody. With the Hop Hop Boys, we out. Peace.